too many things on the stand for me to put my Bible and my outline. So I had to clear it off. It's great to see you this morning. Thank you for coming. It's so encouraging to see so many of our people who are so dedicated to worship that even when things are not comfortable, when things are not as we would like for them to be, you still are here. And we certainly appreciate that and we appreciate all that uh, you do for this congregation. And just great to, to see you today. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. And we're just going to look at this miracle that Jesus performed today. You're going to notice that there were seven miracles recorded by the Gospel of John that Jesus performed when he was here on earth. In chapter 2, there is the water that was turned to wine. In chapter 4, Jesus was approached by a certain nobleman uh, concerning the illness of his son, and Jesus healed him. In chapter 5, he attended a feast in Jerusalem, and he meets a group of people lying by the pool of Bethesda, wanting someone to put him into the water when the angel stirred the water, and it is said that they expected to be healed as they got into that water, but only the first person could be healed, and this man was not healed, and Jesus healed him. This is the fourth, in chapter 9, it's the fourth miracle that Jesus performed. Let me suggest to you that Jesus performed miracles maybe for three or four reasons. Number one, he performed miracles because he cared for people. His compassion drove him to care for people who were ill. Secondly, he performed miracles to prove that he was divine. And we're going to see in chapter 8, that is a big problem. And number three, he, he performed miracles to create believers, to help people to help him, to help believe. And that's what happened to this blind man. Going back to chapter 8, the last few verses, Jesus is trying to convince the people that he is the very Son of God. And that did not go over well. Especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were, by the way, were the priests of Israel, did not believe that Jesus could be the Son of God. They knew who Mary was. They knew that Jesus was born like everybody else. They knew that Jesus had spent his childhood uh, in Nazareth and later Capernaum. And now he's claiming to be the Son of God? They just could not accept that. And they refused to even hear him because of his, his claim. In the last few verses of chapter 8, they become so indignant when he claimed to be the Son of God that they decided they were going to stone him. And they thought they were going to be successful. And it's interesting that in verse 50, when they took up stones to throw at him, Jesus hid himself from them and went through their midst without notice. And that's interesting. Jesus had to escape their indictment. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, it says that he and the disciples were just traveling or walking through the city. And they come upon this blind man. That's interesting. The disciples wanted to know, why is this man born blind? Who sinned that he should be made blind? They believed, evidently the Jewish people had adopted this theology, that if a person is born blind or have some other ailment, it is because he or his parents have sinned. Now he's paying the penalty of sin. You know that the pilgrims in America in the 1600s, they came from England, they had the same idea. They felt if a person was afflicted with a illness, serious illness, it was because they sinned. If a man was righteous, 
And if he was serving God faithfully, he was successful. And uh, he would be prosperous. They developed that idea. And the disciples had that same idea that uh, this man or his parents had sinned, and that's the result of their sin. In verse 3, Jesus answers their question. He says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, the, but that the work of God should be revealed uh, in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. What is day? For the night comes when no man can work. Jesus is dealing with that false conception. Disease is not the result of sin completely. Now, I know that there are some sins or some diseases that uh, are the result of some bad habits. <laughs> you know, over the years I've been really uh, alarmed that the men who have developed the habit of smoking early in life and have smoked all their life and now uh, up in years they are suffering from lung cancer they now are going to blame the tobacco industry. No one made them develop the habit of smoking. And they should have known when they developed that habit that it could create some very strong illnesses. You see, there are some illnesses that we suffer because of the sins or the habits that we maintain. But this man did not have that in his life. He did not sin, and he was not suffering because uh, of a sin. So we find Jesus making a little mud in the dirt, putting it on his eyes, and telling him, now I want you to go wash in the pool of Siloam. How many miracles that Jesus performed that he required action on part of the victim? Not very many. This is probably the only one that John's going to record that Jesus is going to require him to do something very special. I want you now to go to the pool of Siloam and I want you to wash your eyes there in that pool. And when he went and he washed his eyes, he came back seeing. Interesting. Now that created a problem. Now the people were not willing to accept the divinity of Jesus. They were not willing to accept that he was a son of God, that he had all this power. Now they see some evidence. They see a man that they knew was blind. They knew this man had been blind for a long time. And now he can see perfectly. How do they explain that? What do they do to get around that? Well, they tried to discredit the man. They even said, well, I don't even think he's the same man. I, I think he's just an imposter. Well, they lost on that hand. And then they go and begin to accuse his parents and make his parents explain what, what happened. And, of course, there's no evidence that his parents understood what happened. And so, therefore, they have a real dilemma. The only thing they can do to the man is cast him out of the synagogue. Now the synagogue in the days of, the, of Jesus was very important to the Jews. It was their social gathering. That's where they had their school. That's where they took care of all their business. That's where all the prominent people of the village met to deal with the issues of the day. Now they're going to cast him out of that synagogue. He's not going to have any part in any of the social activities of the community. That's serious. And that simply was the only recourse that they had uh, at, at, at this time. So they go through a whole process of trying to explain what happened to this man. And they could not explain it. Now they have a dilemma. Now we could spend a whole hour talking about that miracle. It's the only miracle that I know in the Gospel of John that John spends 
this much time explaining. Evidently, it was important. There are two or three lessons that I think we need to learn from this miracle that I think that will help us. You got your Bibles open, look at verse 31. In verse 31, this man says, now notice, here is a man that was an unbeliever. Here is a man that had no idea who Jesus was. Here is a man that was healed, and now he's struggling with his faith. Later on, he's going to say, I believe. But right now, he doesn't know who Jesus is. So I don't know who he is. I know he's a man named Jesus, and he came, and he, he told me to go worship the pool of Siloam. I went, and now I can see. I don't know how that happened. The man is going to say, on his own, somehow, for some reason, in verse 31, we, now we know that God does not hear sinners. Interesting. How did he know that? But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. God does not hear sinners. That's interesting. Is he saying that I have been blind all these years? I've been an unbeliever and I've prayed all these years and God has never heard me? God has never healed me of my blindness? Is that what he's saying? Or is he teaching you and I something that we need to seriously think about? I don't think this man was inspired. There's no indication that he was. There's no indication that he got this knowledge from God. I don't know if it's just his own human reasoning or, or what, but he knew that God does not hear sinners. And if that was true, John would not have recorded it if it wasn't true. I'm confident of that. But if that was true in the days of John, is it not true today? I hear a lot of people who are unbelievers, who are not Christians in any sense of the word, and they think that they can pray and God's going to hear their prayer. Back in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, Isaiah said that God's ears are closed to the unrighteous. He will not hear their prayers. He will not answer their prayers. And I can't explain that at all. That's God's business. But if this is true, then that's something that you and I need to think about. Prayer is reserved for those who are God's children. By the way, if you're not a child of God, how can you call God Father? In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said that these people had the devil as their father. And certainly, uh, maybe, at times the devil confuses us, deceives us, and answers some of our prayers. That seems to be indicated in Scripture. But I suggest to you that we need to think about our relationship with God. If we are not a child of God, if we have not been born of the water of the Spirit, born into the family of God, how can we call Him our Father? Maybe that's what this man had in mind. Maybe this man had in mind what has happened to him over all these years. I'm not sure. But I know that if John is going to record this, and John was, guided by the Holy Spirit, then there must be a definite purpose for which this verse applies in, in, in Scripture. In verse 35, we begin our text today, when the, Jesus heard that they had cast him out of the synagogue and maybe even the temple. Interesting. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man answered and said, uh, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? He didn't have any idea who Jesus was. He didn't have any idea as to the divinity of Jesus. And so Jesus performed this miracle to be able to make him a, a believer. Okay? And in verse 30, uh, 38, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now, one event in your life can make you a believer? Well, 
To some degree, yeah. I think that a person can become a believer by one experience in life, as this man, maybe. But I don't know how deep his belief would be. I don't know how deep he would believe in Jesus. But I know this. He believed Jesus enough to obey. Jesus told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't ask questions. He didn't argue. He didn't try to sidestep it. He went immediately, exactly, and did what Jesus asked him to do. That demonstrates to me some belief. And maybe there was some belief there before. I'm not sure. But now he has proclaimed that he now is uh, a, a believer. Then in verse 39, Jesus makes this dogmatic statement. A statement that we need to think about. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those that see may be made blind. You see, the teaching of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, always brought a reaction. Jesus never taught anything that didn't bring a reaction. I think so many times today we want to please people, we want to comfort people, we want to encourage people, but we don't expect a reaction. I know those reactions may not be right. Those reactions may not be according to God's Word, but there will be a reaction. Have you ever tried to teach someone the Gospel for the first time? What kind of reaction did you get? Most all the time you're going to get a negative reaction. You're going to get some questions, some reaction that uh, suggests that person is not ready for the Gospel. One time, what, 40 years ago, I was on an airplane flying from Australia to Hawaii and I was able to teach two Malaysian couples. Man and wife on one side and man and wife on the other side. Five seats in that big plane. I was right in the middle. And we began to teach. And for nine hours we studied the Word of God. I'd never met them before. They'd never met me. I don't think they'd ever been exposed, really, to the Word of God. But we studied for nine hours. I made absolutely sure that I did not tell them anything that I believed. I opened the Scripture, I had them read the Scripture, and I had them to tell me what that Scripture said. Not one time did they ever miss what the Scripture taught. And at the end of the nine hours, they were amazed. And one of them said that he his mother would never believe that he spent nine hours studying the Bible. But he said, it was the shortest nine hours I've ever spent in my life in that big airplane. It's amazing. Some people will respond correctly. Some people are hungering for the gospel. But a lot of people want no part of it. I've got a grandson. I baptized that young man. And that young man, for a long time, was faithful to the Scriptures. He married a young lady. He's in the Army now, in Fort Benning. And he tells me that his wife claims to be an atheist. And she won't hear the Word of God. She will not sit and let him teach her the Word of God. Because she wants no use for it. Let me suggest to you, that happens often. There are people in our world, in our county, in our city, who have no use for the Word of God. And when the Word of God is being taught, you have a negative reaction. But notice Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world. He is the judge. He is the one that's going to decide whether we are true to His Word or not. He is the one that's going to decide whether we're faithful to Him or not. Whether we worship Him scripturally. Whether we have done His will. He is going to judge us in the last day. But he says in John 12, 48, that his word is going to judge, judge us in the last day. So we need to be aware, very aware uh, uh, of that. Then, 
as I hurried to close today. Verse 41 is a verse that bothers me. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Is he talking about physical blindness or is he talking about spiritual blindness? A person that is physically blind may have a hard time reading the Word of God. The person that is spiritually blind may have their eyes so closed that they're not going to see the Word of God. They have been deceived in such a way that the Word of God has no relative in their, in their life. I'm not sure what Jesus had in mind, but I do know this, that I have known adults that had the mind of children. For some reason, they were delayed. And if a person does not have the mind to believe, then I can understand he's not responsible for his sins. But those of us that have a normal intelligence, those of us that can read and write, those of us that can understand God's Word, we have no excuse for not understanding God's Word. Blindness spiritually is not going to excuse us. The only way that we can rid our life of spiritual blindness is a study of God's Word. There is light to be seen. Jesus came, John chapter 3, beginning verse 17, to bring light into this world. And if He brings light into this world, he is going to enable us to understand the Word of God and life. But he says, therefore, because we say we can see, we are responsible. All of us who have a normal intelligence that can read the Word of God and understand the Word of God are responsible. And Jesus is the judge. And Jesus will judge us in the last great day. Serious, isn't it? something we need to think about. I close this morning with two scriptures. One scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the thing which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Let me suggest to you, only those who obey him. Because Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Oh, many will come to me in that last day and say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not performed many miracles in your name? Notice they are saying we're doing all this in the name of Jesus. But Jesus is going to say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. That's serious, folks. He's the judge. He's the one that's going to make that judgment. And we need today to make absolutely sure that we today are covered by the blood of Jesus. Let me suggest to you, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation for all of those who will obey Him. Have we obeyed Him? Are we obeying Him? Are we doing His will? I hope none of us, when we meet Him in the judgment, will be surprised to hear Him say, I never knew Him. He knows those who are His. And He blesses those who are His. And we can be that today. And if you are not a faithful Christian, if you have not obeyed the Gospel, the invitation is for you. The cross, kneeling at the cross, where it begins. As we sing this together, let us think about our salvation. Let us stand and let us sing.